Welcome to Straight Talk for Entrepreneurs, where we reveal what it really takes to build a successful business. Whether you are starting with an idea or growing your business, this is the show for you. My guests and I will show you how to build a strong mindset, a powerful body, a profitable business. Hi, I'm Brandon C. White, and this is Build a Business Success Secrets. How about Alan, me? how are you? Uh, hello, hello. I can't tell you how excited I've been for this. Well, great, great. I uh, appreciate you getting back to me, and um, I'm sorry it took me a minute. I, I had sent you a message, and I tried to contact you everywhere, and then uh, finally saw that LinkedIn message when I got back, and I'm, I'm really grateful for you joining. Well, I think, I, think, uh, I, th I think the Blockbuster story fits a lot of what you do on your podcast, so it's, that's <laughs> great. It, 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 how, it does. How, how, not, how not to start a better business. <laughs> well, here's the other interesting thing, Alan, is, is that I worked, uh, um, I wouldn't say it was ever built to fail, but it was, uh, it was definitely a time when they could have transformed themselves. I was an early guy at America Online. And oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 time Warner debacle yeah yeah, yeah. and I actually arrived uh, uh before that and there's so many the thing that I think one is I'm a I'm a junkie for case studies which really is what you've written and and lived over like 35 years um but uh there's a lot of misconceptions about America online out there that that people don't quite understand really what the story was. And uh, when I saw your blockbuster book that is coming out, I said, huh, this is going to it's time for you to write a book. Well, maybe you might talk me into it if you told me that <laughs> it, was, if it was, if it was easy, but um, thank you again. It's not, so it's much. not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> so how, so, so you, I mean, and also, Candidly, you, you talk about if you're a baby boomer, but I'm a Generation X, and I got to tell you that Blockbuster was a big part of my life and the culture as I was thinking about it uh, when you and I had exchanged some emails the other day, you know, is there, and I'm, and I still remember, and I still go to uh, album shops, vinyl, and it was a very similar experience. Yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, people that were not there don't don't re remember that there was a time that you could not watch anything you wanted whenever you wanted to watch it, and and what created the opportunity for the video store is that that was the first time, and uh, it was it was, and of course, I don't know how much you want to get into those early days, but but. Uh, but the VCR was, was uh, you know, the video cassette recorder is what started the whole thing. Well, I'd love, and, to, uh, I'd love to talk about that, actually. Okay. And even about the, um, what was Sony's solution that my dad had? It was Beta. A, Beta, he, Betamax. Betamax tried to make yeah. a run at it, right? And it looked like an yeah. album. Well, no, that was the Laserdisc. Oh, <laughs> that came later. You know, oh. in the very early days of the video business, there were actually two formats. There was VES, which was which was backed by JVC, and Betamax, which was backed by Sun. And so you had two formats duking it out in the early days of video back in the '80s. And eventually, Sony stepped aside, and the and the business went to VHS, and and Beta went away. And, but, and do you but, know, do you know why Sony stepped aside? They, you know, there was, I, th I think a lot of it was the, 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 the video audio files of the day said that Betamax was a, was a better product. But I remember it didn't have as much memory on it and, and they couldn't get a whole movie on some, or some movies anyway, they couldn't get it on one tape and it was creating those kind of problems. And I think I think that 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 VHS recorders got a little less expensive, and I don't remember all of the of what happened to it. But it but within about five or six years in those early days, Beta just kind of went away, and VHS took it over. But but the but the the interesting thing from those days is that the the VCR was obviously created to record television shows when you could so you could watch them at different times, and 
the content producers, primarily Hollywood studios, decided that that was, should not be legal. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, it, 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 the v, so the VCR was almost, almost never happened. It was, it, in fact, the, the Supreme Court ruled it legal in, in just a very slim five to four vote. And that was in, well, I forget the exact year, but it was somewhere around 1984 or five or something like that, that it was, uh, and, then, and then the studios tried to get a law passed to outlaw video stores. And by that time, the business was pretty large. So Congress, the actual, actual bill was drafted to outlaw video stores in the, in the 80s, but it never made it to a vote. So by that time, the business was, a, and we're talking 1985 or so, and by that time, the business was a three or $4 billion industry already. And it's re- the interesting thing about that is, it, is that because it was, it was under such scrutiny, I guess, in those early days, the, the legal aspects of it, as well as whether or not electronic delivery was gonna put it out of business in five or six years, it didn't attract the kind of capital that a typical business of that size does. It was started by a really fragmented group of entrepreneurs all over the country, most of which were undercapitalized and a lot of them weren't great business people. Uh, so that's what that's what that's how the video business got started, and it's what created the opportunity for somebody like Wayne Heisinger, who had just left Waste Management. He had founded Waste Management, which is still the largest trash company in the world, and uh, he got attracted to Blockbuster and bought into it for about eighteen million dollars, and seven years later sold it for over eight billion. So not a bad return on investment. Uh, no, I'd take that any yeah. day. It sounds like a Bitcoin yeah. investment, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's kind of how I got started. Uh, you, you got, you got, so this was 80s, makes a transition. Did you just have a love of business? Was it a love of videos? Was it a love of vinyl? Like I, a lot of things going through my head here. Now, what what got me into it, I came at it, I I don't have an entrepreneurial mind. I have an operations mind. And I was, at the time, I was working for a grocery company called HEB. Have you ever heard of them? I have not. Okay. HEB is is the largest grocery company in Texas. It's a privately owned company. Uh, Their sales last year were $27 billion. Mm. So it's, it's not a small organization. Uh, they have the the highest unit volume of any grocery company in the country, and most uh, most people consider them the best, if not one of the best, if not the best grocery retailer in the country. Uh, they dominate Texas every every place but Dallas uh, because they're not there yet. Uh, but anyway, I was working for them. And in the 80s, the, the, the video business was most supermarkets had video departments in their stores, okay? So it was becoming a pretty big deal then, and, and, but HEB decided they were going to open up freestanding stores that looked very much like a Blockbuster. HEB was the only retailer, developed retailer of any size that ever did that back then. No, nobody, none of the other of the grocery companies, Walmart, nobody, nobody got into the business on that scale, but HEB did. They call those stores Video Central, and I ran operations for those stores from from eighty six to nineteen ninety three. Did they just uh, did they just say, "Hey, Alan, we got this video thing, and you're good at moving groceries in the operational chain. You should do this." It was it was more complicated than that. They had <laughs> they were. They were, they were partnering with a guy named Craig O'Donovich, who was one of the real early trailblazers in the business. And he, he was actually partnering with HEB to run those departments in the grocery stores. They bought his business uh, and brought all of his people in. And uh, they asked me to run the operations and Craig oversaw the, op- the, 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 the total operation. I ran the stores. Uh, so that's how it started, uh, and had, 
had Craig not been a part of HEB uh, at that time, HEB would have never gotten into those stores. But but he had a he had developed a business model that was I say in the book was like kryptonite to Blockbuster, <laughs> and it we opened up our first store and we're doing three times the volume of the Blockbuster across the street. What was the secret? It was, it was, uh, the secret was, and, and in a nutshell, it was larger inventory, much better managed inventory and lower prices. Uh, that was it. I mean, it was, it was, it was not rocket science, but the fact is that Blockbuster was so successful so early that they just kind of never paid much attention to the details of the business. And they allowed people like us to be very, very successful against them. And even though the stores we were competing against, and we, we, had, we wound up with 35 stores before HEB decided to sell them. But we knew that all the, the, all the blockbusters we were competing with were doing about half their, their average volume. And, and they never responded to it. You know, we, you know, they had 3,000 stores at the time. We had 35. So we, we were a, a, a gnat to them. But we were in some major markets in Austin and San Antonio, and, and we had some stores in Houston. We were, we, were, we were doing very well against them, but they didn't, it was kind of a, a window into their thinking. They just didn't have much interest in what anybody else was doing, even though we were very, very successful against them. So we had a different business model. It was very, very profitable. It was just as profitable as theirs was, and it was much higher volume. So, and and it was there a secret to the? Uh, I mean, most companies, if if you know, on a P and L basis, they'll be positive, but really their cash flow sucks because they don't care. You know, their customers don't pay them for 120 days. And I remember the blockbuster gig was you know, there were penalties and there really you wanted that churn so that you could get those blockbusters in the hands of new people, which would rent them, et cetera. W was there any aspect of that, Alan? Uh, we, you know, it, it sounds so simplistic, but, but one of the big things that we did is we rented new releases for a day at a time, one day at a time. Uh -huh. uh, so it was much more efficient. We could charge a little bit less for them. Uh, the life of a, of a video back then, as it really is today, it was the, the, the peak of the, of the demand is the first two or three weeks that it's out. So the economics of that, particularly because back then we were paying about $65 for a movie. Uh, that was the wholesale cost. So uh, your ability to turn that as many times as you possibly could in those first two or three weeks was critical to the econ economics of the business, but it was also pleasing more customers. Blockbuster had a deal that they called three evenings back then. And, and so those movies stayed out as many as three nights. Uh, it was very, very inefficient, but they had themselves convinced that that multiple day rent was a marketing advantage. And we proved to ourselves very early on that it wasn't. So, uh, we, we knew that we had the advantage on them over that. It was not unusual for somebody to walk in one of our stores and see four or five times as many copies of a new release in the store as in one of their stores because we were generating enough volume that we could economically afford to, to buy them. And I would imagine that those, because you were turning that volume, getting new people in the stores, they were also picking out that second movie or third movie that had more than one night, which means you were getting your ARPU average revenue per user was much higher. The, the other secret to the business was that where Blockbuster remarkably in those days thought that old movies were just as valuable as new movies were. And, uh, and, you know, in the very, very early days of video, it was such a novelty that somebody would walk in and be just as happy renting something old as new because it's something they'd never been able to do before. But very early into the game, uh, after people had kind of watched all the ones they wanted to watch or the main ones they wanted to watch, the older movies needed to be priced less. Uh, that's what we did. 
Blockbuster never did. So a customer that would come in one of our stores, yeah, they were coming in probably for a new release, but they would almost always grab something else because it was priced a dollar and across the street at Blockbuster was $3. They never, they, they never did anything to match that. And it, it, it was fascinating to me. Of course, I'm still talking about the time before I joined Blockbuster in 93, but we were always amazed that they never responded to any of it. That's, that's crazy. And, and then the customer feels like they're getting a deal because they're paying that premium, which makes sense to them. And then they might rent two or actually, I'm just, to, to be honest, I, I'm not, I'm just remembering what my wife and I used to do going into the Blockbuster. Yeah. I, I mean, in, yeah. in, into the video and first it wasn't Blockbuster. We had some video store that just did that. And we were like, yeah, I mean, this is a deal. We'll get, we'll get the expensive one and then we'll get two others and we'll be good. Yeah. But if you went in a Blockbuster and went to look at that older movie, it was priced the same as the new one. Uh, we never could figure out why they did that. And, but the, they were, but Blockbuster against the, the, the typical comp competition of the day, they could get by with it because most of the time their competition was, was in poor locations. Sometimes it was kind of dimly lit. It just, they, it wasn't the kind of place you'd go take your family in a lot of cases, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases that that's what the early video stores looked like. Well, I, I got to ask you this question that's on my mind, not to interrupt you, but, and, and some people will probably be like, where's your mind, Brandon? It's in the dirt. But um, the truth is, I mean, wasn't there a lot of porn videos in the sure. early days that sort of broke the ground for the mainstream? I don't know if it broke the ground, but it was, a, but it was for, for a lot of those early video stores, it was a, it was a significant part of their business. You know, and it was it would normally be in a back room, uh, unmarked. It was it was crazy profitable because they would charge more for it. There was no internet in those days, so there was you, you couldn't access it there. So the easiest place to get it was a video store. Now Blockbuster comes along, and not only were the stores brighter and more colorful and 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 user friendly to go into there was there was there was no x-rated movies in a blockbuster hmm. so they of course back then one of their slogans that they used to gain you know to get their national reputation was america's family video store so they they played that up really big so it was a comfortable place to go and for the first five to six years uh they didn't really have to have the best consumer proposition in terms of inventory and price, everything else kind of overrode it versus the competitors that they had at the time. So did they just, and I, you know, other than your book, but, but anybody listening may not know, did, did Blockbuster just raise such a large amount of money and go buy real estate locations that that's why they had the play on this? No, they, uh, they owned very, very little real estate. Uh, it was the money, you know, they continued to, they continued to grow as fast as they could through secondary offerings. You know, they sell stock, they bought competition, but they didn't buy real estate. They, these were, these were almost all, uh, leased properties, uh, and, and usually five to 10 year type deals with, with options going forward. So let's go back uh, 19 somewhere in 1993, the grocery chain sells this and do yeah. they sell it to you or, or no, here, you, you here, switch? Here, here's what happens. And this is a, this is a, a, a really important part of the story because uh, HEB, we still don't know exactly why they decided to sell it because Charles, Butt, who is the owns it, uh, is a pretty private person and the best we could get out of him was that he just wanted to focus on the grocery business. We had become a pretty good size, you know, business within, within HEB. And he, I think he just decided he didn't want to, to, to continue to grow it. So we encouraged him, if you don't, if you're not going to let us grow it, let's sell it and we'll, we'll stay with it and, and try and try to, you know, build a, a larger chain. So he puts it on the market to sell and uh, 
a, a small, who, what was then a very, very small company. Uh, well, let me back up. Blockbuster talked to, Block, to HEB about buying the stores, but uh, never even got to look at the financials. They, they, something just didn't go right in the conversations, which is kind of weird because Blockbuster bought a lot of their competitors, but they didn't, they never escalated the, the discussions with HEB uh, for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, turned away. And then a small company called Hollywood Video, who had only about 10 or 15 stores at the time, comes in. They had been watching us very closely for years and had copied most of our business model. Uh, Mark Waddles was the founder of that company. He had kind of befriended somebody in our organization and learned a lot about how we did things and uh, came in and, 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 and through an IPO, bought those stores for about a million dollars a piece. And uh, so he goes public. Blockbuster continues to ignore them, even though they're, they're rolling out basically the same business model that we had been beaten up on Blockbuster on a smaller scale. And within five years had over a thousand stores. That's when Blockbuster hit its first financial crisis. Uh, due to Hollywood video. And, it, and really, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about the Netflix miss, but that was the first one because HEB was, the, our video central stores were about the size of Netflix at the time of, of that Netflix tried to sell to uh, Blockbuster a few years later. But they didn't have an interest in us either. And, and that led to Hollywood video becoming real quickly the, their largest competitor. So with the same model that you basically, they listened to yes. or, or saw your financials candidly probably yeah. and said, why would we yeah. do anything else other than just dump money into this thing and roll it out? Yeah, because it was almost automatic. I mean, in fact, the, the whole the whole strategy was find the highest volume blockbuster stores and open across the street. <laughs> that was it, because they were already drawing the people to the intersection and uh, and. And, and, the, and the market was so dynamic at the time that you could grow the pie by 50% or so just by opening another store. Hmm. And then a lot, a lot more business would come off of Blockbuster. And uh, Hollywood was rolling out these stores one after another. The, their average volume was close to a million dollars a year, and they were cash flowing about a third of that. Uh, it was a, a crazy profitable business uh, in those days. So they roll all that out and every, and every blockbuster they open against is just getting destroyed. And within just a few years, they had opened enough of them that it had really cut. It had number one, it had stopped blockbusters, same store sales growth and cut their cash flow by at least a hundred million dollars. Uh, and by 1997 blockbuster was cash flow negative, which was only four years four and a half years after they bought those stores from HEV. Oh, I remember seeing a chart somewhere from you yeah. That, yeah. that you, that you charted that, that basically then, then they went, and that was really because of Hollywood video. It was a combination of Hollywood video and Blockbuster continuing to just relentlessly open more stores. To give you an idea, during that time period, Blockbuster's average store sales dropped from about 900,000 to 700,000. Now you can imagine what the economics would do in that situation because the, the video business is a largely fixed cost business. So it was just destroying the economics of the stores. So it was their, their existing stores were, were declining in revenue and they were pumping hundreds of millions of dollars every year into new stores. Uh, and yet, yet they weren't adding any cash flow to the business. And you know what that does. So, so that that's that's crazy, mainly because they were trying to chase growth, but they had a broken model. So they were basically rolling out a broken model on a continual basis, which made them lose more money. Exactly. And the best illustration of that is, uh, you know, if you if you if you move forward a couple of years, when we started to see the numbers, uh, you know, by the time. By the time we get to 1998, 1999, and, the, and, and 
a guy we'll talk about, I'm sure, John Antioca, who had come in and kind of turned the company around and kind of saved it from that debacle. Uh, the company became profitable again, solidly profitable, but they had twice as many stores as they had when the company had sold just four or five years prior. So if you think they, in fact, they, they were about as profitable as they were when they sold, but they had twice as many stores to do it. So all that capital gets invested in it. Their, their profit margins on a per store basis have eroded significantly because the volumes have had eroded. So they pumped all this money into new store growth, yet they didn't get the return on investment on it because the existing stores were in decline. So you can kind of you can kind of see the scenario that's that's building, and this is what leads to huge problems as we get into the early two thousands. And we skipped over the a really important part there in nineteen ninety four, when uh, Blockbuster, which was a public company at the time, uh, sold itself to Viacom in nineteen ninety four, and that's where that's where Wayne and Heisiger and all of the early people in the business cashed out and left. So they, that was a Viacom play thinking that they could control distribution for some of their media. Most likely it was more, it was more of a matter. If you remember back then, uh, uh, they were competing with uh, QVC networks and, and Barry Diller to buy Paramount pictures. That's why Viacom bought Blockbuster. Blockbuster was so cash flow rich at the time that they provided the cash that Viacom needed to acquire Paramount. Uh -huh. And that's what happened. Uh, they, they acquired, they acquired Blockbuster and then within a few months closed the deal to, to, to buy Paramount for roughly the same amount that they bought Blockbuster for is around 8 billion. So Viacom went from mainly a, cable television business back then MTV and Nickelodeon that was their kind of lead brands so they went from that to a company that owned a major movie studio as well as the absolute dominant player in home entertainment it sounded great at the time but it didn't work very well because six years after they bought it they spun off 20% of the company to, to the public and the company was valued at only 2.5 billion. It had dropped $6 billion in six years, in six years. But, it, but in many Netflix ways. and Netflix was just barely getting started at that time. So yeah, Netflix, Netflix had nothing to do with any of that. Yeah. I don't, uh, I would imagine that they, at some point, to your point, didn't really care because they wanted the cash that they didn't have to get the Paramount pictures, which they thought was going to be the the Paramount business. For like yeah, I did well. The cash, as as one of the investors said, they bought it for the cash, but the cash never happened. Uh, so uh, the 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 blockbuster acquisition turned out to be a complete disaster for Viacom, and they spent the next few years ridding themselves of it. And what are you thinking as a, as a guy in the business? You, you, I mean, you, you had come so, so early. Were, were you saying, I think there's an opportunity to own some of these stores? Like what was going through your mind? Well, what, what happened was the, the, how I wound up in it is, is it, and it was really just a coincidence around the time that HEB was selling the stores that I was running uh, a, a franchise group that was having some problems called me up we got to talking and I went to work for them. And that was in 1993. They owned, uh, at, the, at the time, 18 stores. They were in Alaska and they were in El Paso, Texas. And the Alaska stores were kind of struggling. Uh, so it was interesting. They were more than willing to listen to a different perspective on how the business should be run. Blockbuster never was, but the, these, these people were, and they were, they were actually cable television people. The name of the company was Prime Cable, and they owned several large cable systems around the country, the biggest of which was Las Vegas. And they had bought into the, to the Blockbuster business because they thought there might be some synergy down the road somewhere. That didn't really turn out to be the case. 
So it was just basically an investment that they needed to make good on. And uh, they hired me to run it. And then uh, I went in and basically installed the Video Central business model in those stores, completely turned them around. Uh, the first year we won the President's Award for the highest store, uh, same store sales growth in the company. Uh, completely turned it around with a similar business model. We ran at HEB and, uh, and then seven years later, uh, Prime decided they wanted to get out of the business and, and offered it to me to buy and uh, something I'd never done before, try to raise money. And it, it was a $16 million deal. Uh, but, but I raised the money and bought it in early 2000. So that's uh, let's, just, let's just talk about that. You've never okay. raised money. No. You, you, but you do know because you're in the operations that there's money clearly to be made, these things are throwing off 33 or 35% free cash flow effectively. At the, at the store level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so how do you, like, do you go read a book on how to raise money or how does that work? How's that I work got, in Texas? You know, they, what happened is they gave me, uh, I mean, I was an operator. I, I, I knew how to run the business. I didn't know how to raise money. I didn't know what investors wanted to hear and I didn't know what banks wanted to hear. And for this to work, it was going to need to be a leveraged deal. We were going to have to have a lot of debt. So uh, my first couple of presentations to potential investors, you know, I knew this thing would work, but I didn't know how to explain it to them. And I, I learned really early on what they were looking for, internal rate of return, IRR. And, you know, not being a finance person, I didn't even know what that was. But once I figured it out, and I was pretty good with spreadsheets at the time. So once I figured it out and could show them what would ha what could happen, I started getting attention of, of a lot of investors because it was uh, at the rate we were growing. If we could just keep that up, uh, it was pretty evident it was going to be a very profitable deal. So we wound up and I ran into a couple of people that really helped me understand that. A guy by the name of Bill Wildman who put the debt together for us uh, really explained a lot of that to me and helped me build the presentation that investors wanted to see. And uh, so we wound up buying those stores for $3 million in equity from a private equity company in uh, Oakland, California. And uh, we, and, and we did, and, and $13 million, uh, $13 million loan. So I just want to go back. Did you just know this guy or did you run into him? Or you, like, I'm just trying to understand every, like everybody thinks that there's this book we get as entrepreneurs. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> you're like, Hey, I, I know these 10 investors and we're just going to call, ring them up. Like, well, and the thing is for some business, you might not, you might be able to do that, but for the video business who in, in, in the flagship brand was struggling at the time, you know, it wasn't real easy to raise money. So, uh, but there had been a company that had, that had done some early debt with some of the blockbuster franchisees. And, and that's who I talked to initially. There was also a, a lending company called FMAC back in those days. I don't know if you remember them, but they, they lended primarily to, to franchise organizations. I talked to them as well. Uh, and I wound up going with this, these other people. And there were very few people that really understood the video business. And this guy had done some, some loans early on and they had all done very, very well. I think he only had one default out of, you know, dozens and dozens. He'd made a lot of money lending money to blockbuster franchisees. So when I showed him what I thought we could do, he got real, real interested. So, so I guess, I could have never gone to a traditional banker or a traditional lender and gotten the money. Uh, it was, it was, uh, cause they would have never understood it, but he did. So, yeah. The, the, the gen, yeah. I think that's the case for all entrepreneurs. I tell people like yeah. the, the general bank, just, they're just generally not going to get it and you're going to waste your time spinning wheels. That's exactly right. And there's, and, um, uh, there's, there's a handful of lenders out there now specialize in, in, in franchise groups. And, and they've, they've studied those individual businesses and they understand it. So, 
you know, they're anxious to do deals with, with, with good operators. But if you took that same deal to a traditional lender in a, in a bank, you, they'd never get it at all because they're looking for different things. Uh, the, the blockbuster business, like I, I think a lot of franchise businesses, it's very much a cash flow business. There's not a lot of, of hard. Well, as the ongoing cash flow stream, it's not, it's not hard assets. It's not, it's not real estate. Uh, I'm getting a message here. It says my internet is, are you, you are we still okay? Yeah, we're still okay. You okay. stopped there for a second, but we're, yeah. we're catching up. Okay. Um, so yeah, does that, does that get at it? Uh, it yeah, was, it, it, it was, it, it does. It, you just like called some people basically and said, Hey, I want to raise some money. I got a business that I think can make some money. Once you figured out after failing a bunch of times that they yeah. wanted that IRR calculation, basically. That, that was everything to them. That was everything. And once we got them comfortable that, that we could deliver them. And, and in this case, they, they all wanted at least a 30% IRR for us to have any, any ownership at all. You know, we had to give them a 30% IRR before our, the management ownership kicked in. And, uh, in our deal, we, we cashed them out at a 40% IRR in about four years. So wow. we got, we got them out in a hurry. Which was your goal. I imagine. Oh yeah, because that was the only way we were ever going to make any money on the deal. And then we, at the time, then we still had, you know, uh, at least $10 million of debt to pay off. And keep in mind, this is in the early 2000s when Blockbuster is getting in, in financial difficulty. So I do have a question. You were a franchise, you, you were a franchisee of Blockbuster, which it sounds like to me, Basically, you got their sign and their name, but it was your business model because the Blockbuster didn't even understand your business model. Yeah, and that's that was the that was the neat thing about Blockbuster. I, I'm not real familiar with other franchise models, but I know like McDonald's, for instance. There's a there's probably a lot more rules you've got to follow than we did. We bought all of our own product. They didn't have anything to do with it. We set all of our own pricing. We set all of our own terms. We set all of our own late fees, the dreaded late fees. We picked all of our own real estate. Uh, in our case, because we had uh, dedicated markets where we didn't share them with anyone else, we, we did a lot of our own advertising. So we looked at it as we were really running our own company, even our own business, even, even though we had the Blockbuster brand on it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the franchise group within Blockbuster never was more than 25% of the stores. And that's important because most franchise companies are 80, 90, sometimes more higher than that. So it's, they are truly franchise run and financed organizations. Blockbuster never was. And that was good and bad. They didn't pay a whole lot of attention to us because we weren't a, a significant part of the, of the financial picture of, of Blockbuster, never were. But the bad news is, is they didn't pay any attention to us because they didn't care what we were doing. They never listened to us. They didn't have a whole lot of interest in how we were running the business. And even though we were thriving in a lot of those years where they were failing, we never had a substantive discussion about what we were doing versus what they were doing. Because so you, just, you just paid them some... I guess franchise. What was the percentage? Yeah, pay, yeah it, it varied by the time according to when you did the deal, but it was anywhere from four percent to eight percent royalties of top, off the top line, plus top line. advertising fees and computer fees, and you know we were paying a, an average of about eight nine percent to Blockbuster off the top line every year. That sounds so it, expensive. It was very expensive, but. The, earth, the, the business model, when, when run right, you know, you could afford to pay that. Because the margins were still, were you still throwing off 30, 35% free cash? Our, mar, our profit margins, particularly our gross margins, actually went up <laughs> with, as, 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 the, as VHS transitioned to DVD. Uh -huh. and, that is, and that is a, I think, probably the, the biggest part of the whole story because when the business started switching from VHS to DVD in 1997, and by around 2004, the transition was complete. 
the, it completely changed the business because DVD was, was, uh, it was the, the, go back to the $65, uh, video cassettes that essentially created what we called a rental window. Walmart was not going to buy those and, and mark them up and sell them for 80 bucks or $90 to, to customers. So the only people that bought those movies were rental stores. Okay. So we had them as, as much as six months before mass merchants would have them for sale because what they would do is six months later, they'd lower the price to go into what they call the self sell through window. Uh, when DVD came along, everything came out for sale. If you remember, you know, Lion King, all that stuff was coming out at, uh, in DVD and it was, and you could buy it anywhere for around $20. Hmm. We bought it wholesale for about 17. Well, think about that. Uh, we were paying as much as 60 plus dollars for most of the movies in the nineties. And all of a sudden our cost is $17. So we use that to buy more movies, have better availability and improve our gross margins. Uh, and that's what allowed us to succeed. Now the, the, the DVD was created to, to kill the video store really, because the, the studios wanted to, wanted to get their money off of selling versus selling direct to consumer versus selling to video stores because they were only making about a buck 50 off of a rent, but they were making about, $14, $15 off of a sale of a DVD. The good news is, is that even though that transition from VHS to DVD kind of flatlined the growth of the rental business, it didn't send it into decline. It stayed pretty flat. In fact, there was some years in there where it actually grew a little bit, even though Walmart essentially became a direct competitor. And every, and every mass merchant in the country, every supermarket in the country was a direct competitor with Blockbuster because of DVD. And here's the other two things. DVD was such a small convenient package, it allowed mailing them to customers. That's what started Netflix. Netflix started as a buy mail DVD company. Later on, DVD allowed kiosk vending machines to come along where it was never possible with, with cassettes. So DVD allowed the creation of Netflix and later Redbox, And it also made every mass merchant in the country, a direct competitor. So the business just flipped totally and, and how it needed to be run. And Blockbuster really never really ad adapted to that. It doesn't sound like they were in touch with the actual stores, but more in touch with the whatever corporate. Well, well, a few years into the, the conversion, the transition from VHS to DVD, their gross margins, margins were essentially the same. They didn't take advantage of it. They were essentially the same as they were in VHS days. I never could understand that. And they did it because they did a deal that, that's probably too complicated to talk about here, but they did they did a deal called revenue sharing uh, that split revenue with studios and the deals that they did produced the, the same kind of gross margins that they were getting back in VHS days. They, they improved a little bit, but not very much. But you're out there on an island in many ways, running your own gig, still making money. Yeah. So here, here's the, 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 the startling fact is that from 2000, which is when Netflix kind of got going. In fact, that was the year that they tried to sell themselves to Blockbuster and then, and that didn't happen. Well, thank God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> from 2000 to 2007, which is the year that John Antiaco, who was the CEO during most of this time period we're talking about. When he left in 2007, Blockbuster was in deep financial trouble. Now he would say otherwise, but that's just not true. The stock was down, you know, 80% from its highs and they were, they'd already defaulted on some loans. They had, they had escaped bankruptcy a couple of times already. Uh, they were in trouble financially when he left in 07. During that same period of time, we tripled the profits in our company. Oh. And yeah, we're a small company, but we were running the same stores they were. 
there was there was no reason they couldn't have been doing the same things we were doing. So, so you guys, I mean, it was interesting, but you all were probably. Or did you have some other? You talking about other people? Were there? Did you have an operating team that you were the CEO? Did you share, or did you have partners, or how did you set up the your program? We talking about ownership or yeah, management? ownership wise and well, leadership. Well, you know, uh, management had had some ownership, and I shared some of that with the with the key operators in the in the company, and uh, we we and we also were we were kind of geographically challenged because we had stores that were five thousand miles apart. Basically, we had stores in Alaska and and as far south as Brownsville, Texas. That's as that's as far as away apart as you can get. So. We had a lot of independent, you know, uh, excellent people running stores, running groups of stores uh, that, you know, we, we just met the challenge. And, and really, coming from a grocery store business, the video rental business was not all that difficult to run uh, compared to a, to a grocery store. So I never, I never found it. It didn't take it didn't take a, a genius to run a good video store. You just had to pay attention to what was going on. And did you so, run this from a corporate office in Texas? Yeah, we stayed in. We I, I lived in Austin all those years, and uh, our stores were along the Rio Grande River from El Paso all the way to Brownsville in Texas, and then and on, and then all over the state in Alaska. Uh, from and some of those stores were almost two thousand miles apart in Alaska, so. Uh, I did a lot of traveling, but I didn't, I didn't travel to run the stores. I traveled to visit and, you know, strategize. I had good people that ran the stores day to day. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, even when we got the private equity group out, uh, we still had a lot of debt to pay. And, uh, and that was a 10 year loan. So it wasn't going to be paid off until 2010. And uh, everything was going great. We were making decisions based on the fact that we were going to last a while. And then the Great Recession hits in 2008. And that really kind of was a big haircut because we, we didn't see that coming like a lot of people didn't. And we wound up having to restructure the debt and, and didn't pay it off until 2012, which was two years after Blockbuster had filed bankruptcy. Uh, so, we, but we did, we never we never made the money we felt like we deserved because by the time we got the debt paid off, the business was in a pretty steep decline. That's what I was going to say to you. Did you, were, were, did you ever, I mean, you had seen so many phases all the way going to Betamax, to, you know, yeah. the VCR to disc, laser disc. Did you, um, were you imagining that the, and seeing that the internet was getting, was it, possibly some point this would be digitally delivered and that you know you needed to figure out how to harvest the the revenue because it because you didn't think you were going to sell it or did you think you were going to sell this or what or well we we knew that we knew that digital was going to happen eventually uh but we had a lot of faith in the business because we had managed to grow the business as netflix was growing and we were growing the business even as redbox was growing so you know, in 2007, 2008, our most profitable year was in 2007, the year before the Great Recession hit. We had, built, we had grown the business every year. And so, you know, we're sitting there going, hey, we're home free here. We got, we got, we got a couple of years left on the debt. Once we get that paid off, you know, we're, gonna, we're in the money. Uh, and the 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 video business had 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 survived several recessions during its lifespan so even when that happened i thought we would recover uh but we never did you know it the the, the business just declined about 20 20 percent and it never came back which was really weird and and i think a lot of it was because uh you know blockbuster had 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 such had such a poor reputation by that time as just the loser in the whole deal. Redbox was was growing very very fast. Netflix was still growing very very fast, and I think it just it just kind of took the wind out of the sails of video stores. 
And even though we had done really, really well up to that point, uh, we got hurt really bad by the recession. And, and although we, we ran the business another 10 years, and Blockbuster didn't, obviously, uh, we never had the kind of years we had in the, in the mid-2000s. And we were pretty much in decline every year thereafter. Yeah, I I was thinking as you're as you're talking, there was sort of this. So I I'm remembering I actually lived on the East Coast in a small town on the Eastern Shore called Easton, and there was a Blockbuster, and it was super exciting. I mean, and before that, it was just uh, they Blockbuster basically put out the local video store and put them out of business because yeah. they came in with this. You know, they built a building in 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 this town that was probably as big as a supermarket, maybe, um, but there was sort of this feeling because you were reading the press or even if you weren't a business person, you were hearing blockbusters bankrupt or blockbuster this and blockbuster that. And then they put a red box machine uh, at the yeah. Walgreens and at the Walmart and you could reserve it online. And then I remember uh, my dad made the switch before I did because he said, um, yeah, I'm what doing switch to. He went to Netflix. Uh, Netflix. Yeah. He's like, yeah. I'm doing this Netflix mail-in thing. It's great. I get it in the mail. I just watch it as long as I want. And I put it back. And I, I remember telling my wife, Yvette, I was like, you know, dad's doing this. Hey, maybe, maybe we should check this thing out. And, 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 and it, and I will say this, there was nothing wrong at the time with the store of Blockbuster. It was just this feeling that it had, past its time for whatever reason it's really weird Is well that see i i think what made it what you know because I, I i think what where they lost it is they didn't take advantage of all the the things that dvd offered a, a, a real good example is netflix your your dad probably wasn't all that big on new released movies because that was netflix's weakness uh they couldn't really compete on the availability of new releases in those first couple of weeks, because the, there was too much time in the mail. In fact, you know, they they discovered very early on that the only way Netflix could really work is to get people to to want to watch older movies and older older television shows. So their business model pretty much dictated that eighty to ninety percent of all the movies they mailed their subscribers were old. And, and that's I, what they and that's what they did. I think my the blockbuster dad, store was the exact opposite. A block, a typical block, a typical corporate blockbuster store. About ninety percent of what they rented was new, and by new I mean six months to eight months. Almost everything out after release date. Almost everything that they rented was a new release. Almost everything that Netflix rented was old. And they and and they they learned their customer base and, and marketed to them and got, got them convinced that you don't have to rent the new stuff. We'll eventually get it to you. It doesn't matter if you get it the first two or three weeks, we'll get it to you. Don't worry about it. We'll send you something else you like. They did that masterfully. And, and, and at the same time, everything that Blockbuster was doing was hurting the availability of new releases in their stores. It was the only advantage they had. And they were making it worse. Uh, and, and then you have Netflix come along, which was really nothing but new releases. So you've got Blockbuster sitting here in the middle of this storm. You've got Netflix appealing to all these people that, that really don't care that much about getting the new release the first two or three weeks. Now, they were, they were shipping them out, but it, the, it was you were unlikely to get it on the, in those first two or three weeks. And then, and then Redbox comes along, and that's all they've got in those little boxes is new releases. And they're renting them for a dollar. And Blockbuster rents them for four or five dollars. Well, what do you think is going to happen? You've got, you've, you've got this perfect storm of people pulling, of, of, of your biggest competitors pulling customers away. Blockbuster was defenseless. And uh, we were running the same stores at that time, and we were still growing because we understood what Netflix was doing. Uh, over half of the movies that we rented in our stores were old movies. 
it was never as much as 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 Netflix for a, a lot of reasons, but but we we focused on making sure that we had all that old stuff just like Netflix did. And then in in, in uh, Redbox, even though they were they had a they had a great uh, offering to to rent new releases for a buck a day, that's all they had. So if we could create an environment in a blockbuster store that was more fun to go there where you could get anything and yeah, you're going to pay more for a new release, but we got a lot more stuff. Uh, we kept a lot of those customers. Now what Redbox hurt us and they took a lot of customers, but, uh, but we never, but, but we weren't in decline then it, it was the, it was the recession that did it. Yeah, I was uh, thinking back. I think my dad just mathematically said, well, if I get on cycle getting it late, then I'm just always getting a new release for me, whether or not it's six weeks later or exactly. not, doesn't matter. Exactly. And, and, the, and the great thing about that is for Netflix is they use that knowledge to build a streaming business later on. You know, they they figured out, and I would I would love to sit down with, Ted Sarandos, who's their CEO now, was the, was their product guy all those years, and we knew him from back in video days. He was just a you know, he was just a district manager with a distributor back in those days. Right. And he was he's a great guy, and I I th I think that uh, he they learned early on how to market content older content that it wasn't about being new it was about how good it was and could they match up uh with their elaborate algorithms could they match demand to their customer base and they did a brilliant job of it and and i think you know if you go on netflix now a lot of the content is older you know they yeah they've got a lot of new fresh stuff because they've got to because they can't get it from the studios much anymore but uh, up until just, I think, I don't know if they still have the office on Netflix or not, but for years, the office was their most watched uh, program on Netflix. Uh, yeah. The management of Blockbuster, that would have never occurred to them to have old stuff in a Blockbuster store that was continuing to rent. It just didn't occur to them. Yeah, I uh, I remember we used to rent the uh, old seasons. We would wait for a whole season of an HBO thing to come out. And we just yeah. wouldn't rent rent that whole season. But I, I got to say, I, I think Netflix stinks to this day, to be honest with you. But but I'm a subscriber. You're in a minority. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to say this. I'm a subscriber, and I can't not subscribe because they come out with just enough. Yeah, to, yeah. Like it doesn't have the blockbusters, does it? I love the comedies, right? But you know, they 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 have good content, but a lot of it is old, and mm -hmm. you know. But I can't cancel it. But I, I'll tell you how they could fix it if they they're probably not even listening to you and I. But maybe they are. Uh, is they need to fix their interface because their interface is horrible. Like I, I think it just doesn't recommend. I can't even find my own list sometimes, and I know somebody's going to tell me you go over to the left, and if they are on the left, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But um, that's me on a rant about Netflix. But um, but it makes me wonder, you know, if 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 we we had a we had a program in our stores in those days, and the way we fought Netflix on on that is we had a program that we called "We've Got It or We'll Get It," and we literally would buy anything a customer requested because in those days uh a dvd would cost you know seven eight bucks you know it wasn't that expensive the wholesale cost the uh, the old ones so we had it we had a deal where the customer came in we didn't have everything like netflix had but we had everything that a customer ever asked for so in some of our stores we would have as many as thirty thousand dvds in our catalog oh inventory God. God, 30,000. And we were renting that as many as in, the, in some of our higher volume stores in Alaska, we were renting those as many as 10,000 times a week. That was three, three to four times more than a blockbuster was renting of everything. So we were proven to ourselves that, that there was a massive demand for this, but you had to have it and you had to have it priced right. 
because you couldn't rent it for four dollars uh, so we were renting it for a dollar and and in some cases even less and uh, we were generating infinitely more revenue out of that product than blockbuster was and that's how we fought netflix on that uh, we we knew that the huge weakness that, that, that their weakness was new releases but our weakness was was the older catalog titles so we just committed that if if a customer wants it we're going to have it and what that produced is a whole bunch of stores that had very customized inventories to, to what people that asked for and I remember, I remember, in fact, I tell the story in the book, uh, John Antiaco coming in on one of our stores in, in Anchorage and, and I'm showing him the, the inventory of this and this particular store had an inventory of about 25,000 units. Now, not 25,000 titles, it was probably at least 10,000 titles, probably more like 12 or 13,000, uh, just the catalog. And we were renting it 10,000 times a week where they were renting, just to put this in perspective, the typical blockbuster of the day was renting about six or 700 catalog titles a week, six or 700. We were renting 10,000 in that store. So what, a, what, a, what one of our customers came to one of our stores for, for versus what a corporate blockbuster customers going to the store it was just totally different it was a we were running a completely different business and it's why when i would have want to have discussions with them about it they just you know it just we were on different planets and and they did they they didn't have any interest in it well i gotta ask you uh how did you did you display all ten thousand or twelve thousand titles and all those racks in the store yeah. Did you really? God. Yeah, what we did is we, uh, you know, Blockbuster didn't do it in very many stores, but uh, you could go as, 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 you could go like 10 shelves high. In fact, I remember as we, as we continued to add inventory, we had to add rows. Well, I mean, we were, the, the stores were just jammed. In some cases we would have to bookend it, you know, like going into a library. Uh, and, Every time we would do something like that, I would get worried. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd get worried. Well, okay, that's gonna, that's a little bit too high. Are people gonna want it? You know, or is it, is it still gonna rent? And then, then when the inventories get so big, particularly in the smaller stores, you walk in one of our, we had a little store in Soldotna, Alaska that had massive inventory in 3,000 square feet. Virtually the entire catalog was bookended. It, you walked in there, it looked like a library. So, I was obviously very, very concerned about the presentation. You know, it just, it, it didn't look like what we would want it to look like. But amazingly, it didn't hurt the rents. People would still go digging through it and find, you know, find what they're looking for. It was more important to have it than to have it look pretty. And, uh, and once we figured that out, we just, we just kept piling in the product. People didn't care if it looked perfect. That's a really important there, point. If it was there and, and it was organized where they could find it, they didn't care what it looked like. That's a really important point. Yeah. Because if you are stuck on just the aesthetics and didn't listen to the data, which comes out of the cash register, right? you guys would have, and ladies would have lost a lot of money. And that's what we were doing. We were just following the customer. You know, we knew we needed to have it in there. We didn't have the space to do it the way we would like to do it, but we just kept putting it in there and it just kept raining. Uh, and the, and the smaller stores where the presentation was not very good, their numbers were just as good as the big ones. It, it, it just didn't seem to matter. So we weren't, we just weren't concerned about what it looked like because we knew the customers didn't care. So why, why should we care? Oh, I mean, you listen to the data, right? I mean, the, the cash register is going to tell you what, what's really happening. Yeah. You know, so I came I, from grocery store days where, you know, you walk down an aisle and the, you know, the top shelf is six, seven feet up, right? Well, that's what our stores started to look like. Uh, where you go in a typical blockbuster store and they still had the low profile sh shelves in most of the stores. And uh, they didn't have near the capacity that we did. Uh, and yet we even had stores that we couldn't put it face out and had a book in. They would have never done that because it would have looked, it wouldn't have looked right. But 
well, we knew I, that our customers didn't care, so we just kept doing it. So I have a question for you related, sort of off topic, but I'm curious of your thoughts. So what about this buyer paralysis thing, right? The, I mean, there's there's a ton of studies out there that said it. If you give a consumer too many choices, they get, they get, they they lock up, right? Like you know, and you're you're off at whereas if you say here's the three things, not maybe not videos, obviously, but uh, here's three things or here's the two colors, it the consumer will buy more readily because they don't get locked into this decision paralysis. Did you ever think about that, or did that ever come up in in how the the business dynamics worked? It's a great question because we did, and we were concerned that uh, the stores were going to get going to get difficult to shop. That it was going to be difficult to walk. There was such a massive selection that we were getting concerned that it would they would get lost in the morass of all the titles. So here's what we did. Uh, one of the smartest things we did, we created, uh, if, you, if you picture this picture this catalog section in a typical store that had, let's say, 10,000 titles. Well, out of those 10,000 titles, there's really maybe five or 600 that are generating probably three-fourths of the revenue. And there's not one copy of them. There could be six, seven, eight copies of them. We pulled all those out of the catalog section and put them in their own section, called it Blockbuster Gold. Uh, put it in its own section. I'm in laughing. A very high pro- Brilliant. In a very high profile section of the store. So that everybody would, in some cases, it was, it was, it was, it was, it would either be the first thing you walked in, then this, you saw it. And the other thing is, is that we, we charge more for it. It was still it was still just a buck and a half versus a dollar for all everything else, but we were so committed to having it and having it in stock that we 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 jacked up the price fifty cents. Well, that small section of movies turned out to be about fifty to sixty percent of all the revenue that we're generating out of the catalog in that one section. And what, what and what would typically happen, and, and there could be you know five hundred, depending on the store, there could be five hundred to a thousand titles there grouped in one area, and it was all the evergreen stuff you know that that rented forever you know, and uh, and we would have big quantities of it, like all the Star Wars would be there, and all you know all that all the diehards would be there, and all that stuff. So if you wanted to go in there and see all the high profile movies that might be 10, 20, 30 years old, that's where they were. They were all in one spot. That was so successful, we wound up doing the same thing in the family section, where we would pull out primarily all the Disney stuff and put it in its own section. And then television got to be such a big deal in DVD because you know, in VHS days, it was very inconvenient because you couldn't skip to the to the episodes. So DVD got to be as much as 20% of the business, the television DVD in some of our stores. So they were huge sections in catalogs. So, and we had so much of it that we broke out gold sections of television as well. So that addresses what you're asking. That the Yeah, there's 10, 15,000 titles in there. But the ones that most people are going to want to watch, they're in smaller sections. And then if you want to go dig into the to the really deep catalog, it's there, but it's not going to be as convenient for you to go shop. Isn't so that's that, how we did it? Oh, I appreciate you answering that because I never re, uh, I remember those sections, but I I'm, I was laughing when you were saying it because I'm like blockbuster gold you just make it up you charge 50 percent more and there there, you haven't done anything and i couldn't help but say this alan and you're going to appreciate this i hope is that this is the butcher presentation in a supermarket right they they have all the shrimp they have the the these quote unquote prime cuts of beef but what i later learned from a butcher friend is that those shrimp that are in there that may be priced more are no different than the frozen shrimp, except they've unfrozen them and presented them differently. Yeah. And th- th- they're like the, the blockbuster gold. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and, and it, it became a very popular place to go in the store. It was, it was kind of the secondary destination beyond the near lease wall. And did you, so you did think about, did you experiment with that and then just listen to the data and then just roll it out into your other stores? Yeah, well, we were convinced that we had to do something. So we didn't really test it. We did it in every store. Uh, and because we felt like we had to, to make it, if nothing else, make it more convenient to shop. And if I remember right, I don't think we, pro we, they, we didn't mark it up when we did it initially, but it was so popular and we were having so much trouble keeping it in stock that we said, okay, we're going to commit to never being out of stock on, on these titles. We're going to buy it deep enough that we'll never be out. Now, Sometimes we were, but more often than not, we had it. We had multiple copies, enough of them that we were always in stock of, on it. And we, and we, we, you know, we charged fifty cents more to help us, you know, replenish it and keep and keep it in stock. So where you would walk in a blockbuster store and there might be two copies of Star Wars, we might have twelve. Uh, that might not be an example of a title that ran that much, but there were some back there like that, you know, that we would. And, and it would just continue to rent and rent and rent. I think that's really cool. So yeah. how, how does the, you, you run these 2008 happens, you lose about 20% of your business. I think you said it doesn't really come back. You, yeah. you, you got still have overhanging debt that takes you to 2012. What was going at this point? Are you saying to yourself, okay, I'm in it. I'm going to, try to pay off this debt and then just harvest the cash. And eventually I just see this thing sunsetting or did yeah. you think of something else? Well, I mean, the, no, obviously exit was never an option because we could make more money running it than we would ever get from somebody buying and nobody wanted to buy blockbuster stores by then. So that was never an option. So it was just a matter of, could we run them as, you know, how long could we run them profitably? And we didn't, we didn't know the answer to that, but, uh, you know, we, we got forced into doing shorter term lease renewals, you know, because we couldn't commit to five years in a lot of cases. So, uh, you know, some stores closed before their time because our landlords wouldn't cooperate with us because, you know, they'd want a five-year renewal and we're going, hey, that's crazy. We can't do that right now. There's too much, you know, there's too much uncertainty. So a lot of stores stay open uh, longer because landlords worked with us, others did not. But, uh, you know, the business was still, it, it was, it was still solid. It's just that, we could we could see that it was it was go, it was it, it, we had lost twenty percent. In most cases, we were continuing to trickle down a little bit. And keep in mind that by by this time, Blockbuster has filed bankruptcy. That happened two years after the the Great Recession hit. Uh, so Dish has bought them out of bankruptcy for three hundred million dollars. And, and within two years after that, it's pretty much pretty obvious they're done and they start closing stores. So for about three years after they bought the stores, they closed, it's closed what was left and they're all gone. So the, you know, just the blockbuster didn't stand for much uh, good at that point. And, and we were fighting an uphill battle. So we knew that it was just a matter of how long can we do this? Uh, and you know, and every year you just could have kind of took stock of, okay, what does it look like now? What are we going to have to do to survive another year? And obviously we didn't want to lose money. Uh, we were, we never, we never, uh, we never cut anybody's pay during that whole period. We eliminated bonuses unless we, you know, had some money to, at the end of the year to pay out. And we gradually, uh, eliminated some of our benefits but we never reduced any salaries during that time uh, or hourly rates. So, uh, you know, we just kind of held it together as best we could. And I think and, and, our, and our last store closed in 2018, which was eight years after Blockbuster filed bankruptcy. 
which actually I want to talk about because I was actually shocked at that. I think at the height you were doing 35 or 34.6 million or something like that. Was that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, 2007, we would have done about 35, 36 million in sales. Um, so, so, so you, so management was able to take some money off the table, I assume, to st stash away for uh, another time. Well, we were drawing nice salaries uh, and, and uh, we were getting enough money out of the company to pay taxes. And for anybody that's, that's uh, been through something like this, my biggest mistake was not preparing for income tax liability. Uh, on that one, you're that on was your a hard early. lesson. That was a hard lesson because uh, when, a, when a deal is structured like that, you're writing stuff off so fast that you don't owe much income tax. And this was, this was a, an LLC. So uh, uh, the tax liabilities were passed through to the, the partners of which I was one. So uh, for anybody listening in a deal like that, save your money <laughs> to, to pay income taxes later because you'll owe them later. And our problem was that we still had all that debt and as you get to the tail end of the debt, you don't have the interest to write off. So your, your tax liabilities are going up while your cash flow is going down. So it, uh, it got to be kind of a, you know, a tight situation toward the end. We were still making money, but our tax liabilities were very high because we didn't have hardly anything to write off. All the interest, most of the interest had been written off the the most of the fixtures and inventory have been fully depreciated by that point. So we got a lot of taxable income and less cash to pay the taxes off of it. So what did you do? Does that make any sense? Oh, it makes complete sense. <laughs> I, I, mean, I know a lot of people who, who made a lot of money on a P and L and cash flow basis and didn't realize that on, on April 15th, there was going to come a, a check that you were going to have to write that. Oh yeah. Save, save up your, your, your nickels that uh, I don't know how you're going to generate that, that, that. The, 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 the biggest mistake I ever made I, when we bought the company and I was keep in mind, that's the first time I've ever owned a company. And I didn't, I didn't understand, you know, all of the ramifications of it. I was just running a business, you know, I didn't. Uh, so I should have had a, a, a tax professional come in and teach me exactly what all this looks like. Here's your, Here's how, here how, how's your, your depreciation, everything's going to run. Here's going to be your tax liability, your first five years estimated. Here's going to be your tax liability, the second five years, you know, plan for it. And don't assume everything's going to go beautifully because it may or may not. And, and we, I, you know, we got kind of caught in a situation where those first several years, things went so well that we just always assumed we'd have the money to pay the taxes. And then when 08 came along, that changed everything. Well, nobody could have predicted that. And we survived it, unlike a lot of businesses that didn't, but uh, it was tough uh, for, uh, in those years. So what happens towards the end here? You you get to the end, you're at one store. I, I assume you cut the staff. Is it just you and a bookkeeper and someone else running the show or yeah i just it was a gradual process we uh you know we had as many as 13 people in our our corporate office here in austin at one time and uh that eventually got pared down to just me and our controller who was doing all the books and uh, and i was doing all the buying and you know everything else and uh just just gradually closed the stores a little bit at a time. Uh, we closed the last stores in El Paso in 2016, then uh, closed the last stores in the Rio Grande Valley in uh, early 18, and then closed the last stores in Alaska in you know in the summer of 2018. I'm actually really impressed that you made it as far as 2018, mainly just because of the onset of the internet and the, and the downloads. But Alaska makes a lot of sense because they don't have good bandwidth. Got a lot yeah. of cold months. They're watching TV a lot, right? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 we had, we, we had advantages there because of bandwidth. Uh, but we had disadvantages too, because the cost of operations up there is very high. Mm. You know, uh, every, everything's more expensive in Alaska. So 
Right. Uh, particularly real estate and labor is more expensive. So, and, and Netflix was a particularly attractive offering because they deliver it to your house. You don't have to get out and drive on the snow. So we were real concerned about all that. So yeah, Alaska was a great place to do business, but you had to do it right or it would, or it, it would turn on you. So. So here we are now, are you retired? Well, for the last three years, I've been working on this book. So uh, three years. I'm, wow. I'm very much, I'm, I'm very much not retired, <laughs> but I don't know what I'm going to do now. Uh, I started thinking about this book about a year before we closed the last store and started researching and conceptualizing what it might look like and uh, and eventually decided I really wanted to do it. And the main reason was because the common narrative about Blockbuster's failures at Netflix killed them. And there's nothing that could be further from the truth. That is just not what happened. Uh, Blockbuster was in big, big trouble way before the Netflix as people know it today existed. Netflix didn't stream a movie until 2007. And they didn't really become a streaming didn't become a significant part of the business until several years after that. And by that time, Blockbuster is gone. So uh, I just really wanted to, Blockbuster is a very interesting story in that it was, it was founded by one of the great entrepreneurs in American history, Wayne Heisinger, who founded Waste Management, Blockbuster, and AutoNation. He's the only, he's the only person to ever found three Fortune 500 companies. And, uh, but Blockbuster was never built as a, they never built a culture of operations excellence. And they were just consistently outsmarted by people with much fewer resources that just got dug into the details of the business more than they did. And uh, Blockbuster was in big trouble long before, you know, the, Netflix was even an issue. Uh, and so I really wanted to, to tell that story because I think there's a lot of great lessons in there to learn from it. Uh, you know, Blockbuster had its own set of challenges, but every company does. And any, companies, in any company that has had huge success up front, you know, needs to be very, very wary because just because you did the first few years doesn't mean you won't, doesn't mean you will the next few years. Yeah, I'm excited. I haven't read your whole book yet, but I, I read a piece of it. I, I didn't read some of it on purpose because uh, I told you I, I didn't want to have a pre, pre uh, prescription here for our conversation. Yeah. I, I wanted yeah. to discover what what really happened. Yeah. But I'm I'm really excited now. Is is the book out or is it coming out soon? It can It 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 official launch date was March the 9th. So yeah, it's been out about a week now. Oh yeah, it's uh, already, already uh, a number one bestseller on Amazon. Uh, oh, several, that's incredible. Several categories. Uh, a lot of very gratifying feedback I've gotten on it. Uh, so yeah. what what was the, uh, if, you, if you're willing to talk about it, because I, I read about this and I, I scoured, like I told you, to get a hold of you because I was so excited to hear this story. And I'm so grateful for you coming on and sharing it because you have, you know, first, you, you're in that seat driving the whole way really seeing seeing what happened how did you have have you how did you is the book just organically getting number one or did you actually uh in your operational planning that i know you have plan plan this out to to make sure that you could achieve that well i've got the assistance of a, of a, a great company that called uh scribe media uh who happens to be bought based on here in austin uh and they you know, even even though I think I've got a great story to tell, I'm not a writer, so I'm not going to go get a, a a deal with a traditional publisher. So, and there's there's thousands of us like that. You know, we've got a great story to tell. We want to tell it, but we don't understand the publishing business. So, that's where Scribe Media stepped in and helped me figure out how to do it, how to get it published, and how to market it. Now. I don't have a big marketing budget to do this, but th there's been a, we've done a, we under, they understand how to get your book noticed. 
And, you know, with the Blockbuster name, obviously we've got a lot of built-in audiences out there. The, all the franchisees, a lot of corporate ex-employees, uh, Hollywood studios, distributors. I mean, there's all kinds of people built in out there that, that ought to have an interest in it. So we targeted them. And uh, not all of them, obviously, but, but a lot of them. And, and hopefully it'll kind of grow organically from here if people like the story. And so far, the feedback I've gotten has been almost all positive. Oh, I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine there'll, there'll always be somebody out there. Um, but I, I got to tell you, as I'm listening to you, Alan, I'm thinking to myself, for the guy who says he wasn't an entrepreneur and, uh, or, or born an entrepreneur or whatever that is and wasn't a book writer, you sure did run a successful business and now you got a number one selling book. So whatever you're doing now, and I want a little piece of that magic. So I'm going to read that book uh, front to cover or uh, front to the back to, to get a piece of that. Um, I think you already gave some good advice. Would you have any advice for, you know, there's been pieces as we've talked today, but if you were to say three pieces of pieces of advice for an entrepreneur out there, what, what would you give them? Well, I think the first one is is you you play off the what we've been talking about a lot. The uh, uh, early success does not ensure sustained success. Uh, there's and what I learned uh, through this whole process is there's a lot of people. And when I say I'm not on, entrepreneur, I'm not the kind of person that's going to go mortgage my house to start a business because I think I've got the secret sauce, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not the kind of person that does that, but a lot of people are. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that those are the kind of people that can transition a business into a great operating business. Wayne Heisinger was, was one of the great entrepreneurs of all time, but he had very, very little interest in the inner workings of a blockbuster store. So for anybody that's that's studying the story of blockbuster that's the first lesson i mean as great as wayne heisinger was he didn't have a clue what was going on in a blockbuster store other than it made a lot of money he really didn't and he put people around him that didn't understand it very well either he tried to to offset that that lack of knowledge with bringing in retail people but he didn't give them the real authority to establish the culture in the company I don't think, and I think the evidence proves it. There's a lot of examples of founders that were great operators, uh, but if you're not, if you're a founder and you're not a great operator, find one, because if you don't, bad things are going to happen. I think that the next thing is, and I've always thought this from going back to my grocery days, know more about your competition than they know, know more know, know about you. Uh, and by doing that, you'll know your business better than anybody. Uh, if, if you allow a competitor ever to know more about you than you know about them, then you're in trouble. I just, I think that's a very simple rule to follow. And last, uh, measure what matters. And then, and, and, and then kind of an inside definition of that is you gotta know what matters. Figure out what matters and then measure it relentlessly and make sure that you never deviate that from that. Uh, and we did that in our company and it was difficult at times because Blockbuster's management information systems were so elementary that uh, we had to come up with ways to get information that they didn't have readily, readily available to us. Uh, so, you know, most businesses, there's not that many things that are really, really important. But whatever they are, I mean, zero in on them and, 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 and make sure everybody in your organization understands what they are. I think those are some great pieces of advice. Where is the best place for someone listening to buy your book? Well, Amazon's the obvious, but uh, it, it's, it's there in Kindle and paperback and hardcover. And it can be bought any place that online books are sold. Uh, I don't know that any stores have picked it up yet. Hopefully they do, but uh, that's where it's available right now. Uh, and uh, Built to Fail. Yeah, Built to Fail, the inside story of a blockbuster's inevitable bust. <laughs> Clever title. <laughs> I like it. I, I actually love it. Well, Alan, 
thank you for being generous with your time uh, this evening and best of luck. I, I'd love to have another conversation with you uh, about some other things in business after you've done your book tour and s- sold a few hundred thousand books and uh, you, you have some time. What What is next for you, by the way? I'm just trying to figure out what happened. I'm just kind of listening to the feedback to the book and we'll go from here. I don't know what's going to come of it. Uh, it's It's been... I've been so consumed with it for so long that I, I don't know. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I hope, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I hope that, I hope that it, it, that the story is still relevant enough that, that people want to know more about it. And, uh, you know, I'd love to, to, to speak to groups about it. I think there's a lot of lessons to learn. The cool thing is that most people remember Blockbuster unless they're too young, you know, and it's so, they understand it from the from the customer point of, per, point of view, so maybe they can relate to the business side of it and and why it fell before its time, because it really did. It, there should still Blockbuster should still be alive today in some form or fashion. Certainly not as a store based business, but they they should have been the ones that transitioned to the internet, not Netflix. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening, Alan. Thank you. Built, built to fail. Find it on Amazon. Thanks again. Great to talk to you. Likewise. Take care of yourself. Right.